common security issues and misconfigurations. I am Sean Metcalf, founder and CTO of Trimark. I put a QR code on here because who doesn't love QR codes? I'm the founder and CTO of Trimark. We are a professional services company that performs very comprehensive security assessments of Active Directory, Azure AD, and VMware, which kind of works out well because I'm talking about at least two of those things today on stage. Uh, I am a Microsoft certified master in Active Directory. There's about 100 in the world, most of whom work at Microsoft. Uh, I am a co-host on the Enterprise Security Weekly podcast, um, and I have spoken at a lot of different conferences. I'm very happy to be back at B-Sides Charm. So my first conference talk was at B-Sides Charm in 2015, at first conference talk ever. I took a little bit of a hiatus over the past couple years for conference talks, and this is my first one back to conferences in person at InfoSec. So 2015, 2016, 2017, 2018 to 2019. I just want to promote a talk that I did, fail time from 2018. If you ever feel like things are challenging and you can't figure out how to get past that, watch that talk. Because I talk about how important failure is in order to succeed. I talk about my personal struggles with failure because one of the things I've heard, I've done about 30 conference talks around the world. One of the things that I've heard from audience members from time to time was, have you ever failed at something? <laughs> I'm like, yes, all the freaking time. But it's just like social media. Social media doesn't talk about failures. They talk about the things that go well. These conference talks rarely highlight things uh, that don't go well. So what are we talking about today? Like I said, the common issues with Active Directory, Azure AD, and ID. Uh, I'm going to talk about the risks of the cloud. I'm going to talk about the midnight blizzard attacks against Microsoft, Okta security concerns, Caesars MGM, and then wrap it up letting you know how things are. Uh, so there's a lot to get to cover, so I'm going to cover it quickly, uh, some of these slides. I'm not going to cover everything on every slide. The slides will be available after the talk. So at Tech, uh, I in 2022, I talked about defending the identity nexus. I call the situation we're in today the identity nexus. The, the nexus is a connection of two or more things. And we are in this place where we have directory and we have infrastructure. And this spreads across on-prem and cloud. And it doesn't need to be just, just be Microsoft. So I have Active Directory, Azure AD, and Azure, and VMware. But it can be any number of things. And the challenge with this identity nexus is we end up in a situation where it's not these pleasant buckets or boxes that are separated very logically. We know that life is messier than that. Uh, these things are interconnected in ways that, well, only attackers really know how they're interconnected these days. Uh, documentation exists, but uh, as soon as we document it, it's out of date. So Active Directory, we see a lot of Active Directory issues uh, in all the assessments that we do. And in 2019, I put together this slide. So five years ago, I said, these are the things that are problems in Active Directory. GPO permissions, AD permissions, group nesting, over permission accounts, service accounts, Kerberos delegation, password vaults like CyberArk, and backups. It's five years later. How much better is it? Not at all. <laughs> but, but, but there is some good news, because this is the same slide I showed five years ago. And let's update that today. We do have some progress. So some of these things are better. We don't see as many regular user and AD admin accounts. Azure AD, Entry ID is a totally different situation. I'll get to that. Um, we used to not have any naming account standards whatsoever. Uh, I had one customer that said, uh, we had a conversation, did an assessment, and they had all these different accounts, and there was no naming standard for admins. And they go, ah, but the attacker doesn't know what our admin accounts are. And I said, yes, they do. It's this list right here. I said, all you're doing is confusing your people and make it tougher for your auditors to actually know who is supposed to be in those admin groups. We're better at that now. Uh, we have group policies for domain controllers that are actually customized, that have security controls on them. Uh, we don't link as many GPOs to servers and domain controllers that we used to. So that's good. But we still have a lot of these same issues. From admin accounts with old password, OK, Sean, what's old? Uh, how many people think that three years is old? Five years is old, seven, 10, 15. How about 20 years? OK, trivia question. How old is Active Directory? Not the Trimark folks. <laughs> How old is Active Directory? 23 years. Uh, about 24 now, because it's 2024. Um, we have seen passwords that are 20 years old. 
I don't know about you, but my passwords from 20 years ago were pretty horrible. I can guarantee you those were also. Uh, accounts with Kerberos service principal names. That's how Kerberos works. You have a service count. It has a Kerberos service principal name associated with it. And that points and attaches that service count to that application. We find user accounts, admin accounts for people that have spins associated with them. That's bad. I'll explain why service counts, and then overall how these accounts are used, where they're used. Uh, like I said, 80 admins with old passwords. There are two primary attack methods against old passwords. Password spraying, which is basically going through and picking a word or whatever that password could be. Uh, right now it's spring 2024. That will rotate just like the seasons to summer 2024. And users are using these passwords. They're horrible, but they're, uh, they're horrible because they're guessable. But the problem is we're telling users that they have to change their passwords every two months, every three months, every six months. They're going to find the easiest way to change that password because that password is the thing that stops them from doing the work that they can then get done in order to leave at the end of the day or leave whatever room they're in in their house and then go to the other room in the house where they have their Xbox. So they'll go through and attempt to authenticate as every user with one password. If that works for any of them, they know the password. They'll move on to the next one. They'll do this completely automated. And Kerberosing takes advantage of the fact that we have Kerberos service principal names on accounts. Kerberosing is this incredible technique that Tim Medine came up with, which basically said, if I get the service ticket that's associated with this whole Kerberos thing, which I don't have time to get into, ask me later at the Trimark booth. I'll talk Kerberos all day long, including we have a bunch of Trimark folks there that will talk about it as well. And you can take that service ticket offline and then just throw it passwords that have been hashed with the MT, uh, MT uh, hash function. And then if we're able to open that ticket, we've guessed that password. So going back to what I just said about old passwords, passwords that are three, four, five years old, especially service count passwords, how often do service count passwords change? Never, exactly. So that means that attackers can just sit on that and have fun with it, right? So we need to limit this password attack capability. We need to make sure these passwords do change. Uh, we had a customer that said, yeah, we have this service count password. We know it's 10 years old. We can't change it. I said, why not? So we don't know what will happen if we change it. I said, I have questions. <laughs> so if you have a service account whose password you cannot change for an application, is that application supportable? Truly, is it supportable? So they're like, all right, what do you suggest? Have you ever heard of the screen test? <laughs> Change that password over the weekend and see if anyone screams. I tell you about 70, 80-ish percent of the time, there's no screaming or no loud noises that come as a result of changing it. It's got to change. The default domain administrator account is created when you set up Active Directory and then is forgotten about. If you have two domains in your environment or if you are assessing an environment that has two domains, a root domain and a child domain, I can almost guarantee you that they have completely forgotten about that root domain domain uh, admin account, the default one. Uh, these are the things that you should be looking at. Um, check this for all of your AD admins. This PowerShell command at the top, get AD group member, administrators recursive, 98% of the time will give you a list of all of your AD admins in your environment. Check those to make sure that they have updated passwords, that they don't have spins. We've actually published a script uh, here at the bottom. The uh, AD check script is actually on our GitHub now. I need to update that link. And it will run through a number of the common issues that we see in Act Directory, including many of the ones I'm talking about here. So there's a number of things that you can do to improve the security of your Active Directory admins. Why do we care about admins? They're the one with all the rights. The majority of breaches that happen and have happened in the past couple of years based on my conversations with cyber liability insurance companies happen because service accounts have old and bad passwords. Service accounts. We need to make sure that service accounts have better long passwords. That's, that's it. They need to be 20, 25 characters or longer. If they haven't changed in the past few years, we need to make sure they get changed somehow. Kerberos delegation is this magical thing that means impersonation. So effectively, we have a user on the workstation. They log into the web server using their regular user credentials. And then that web server needs to do an update on that database server. With Kerberos, 
when this happens and this user makes an update in this web server application, this web front end of that application, the updates on that database server will be performed under the context of that web server. That's not helpful because then you have no idea who made those changes or if uh, someone maliciously makes a change, that would be bad. So enter Kerberos delegation. Unconstrained delegation back in the olden times, as my kid would call it, of Active Directory, very insecure. Um, it should not be existing anywhere on any network uh, ever for Active Directory. There's about one or two applications in this world that I've seen that actually require unconstrained delegation. Uh, constrained is the thing that solves that, it's better. Um, constrained with protocol transition is a way that uh, that server can say, that web server can say, hey, this person can uh, authenticate it to me, give me a Kerberos ticket for them that's delegated. So I call that Kerberos magic. And then finally, uh, something that's been used by uh, attackers a lot recently is resource-based constrained delegation. So the key points here is we need to make sure that we are protecting our AD admin accounts. One of the best ways to do that is add it to a group that Jake Hildreth is gonna talk about tomorrow at the same time on this same stage. But really the best thing to do is to go through and make sure that we are pr better protecting these accounts we are removing delegation that we don't need anymore. Uh, we find Kerberos delegation configured for service counts that actually don't have any spins. Guess what? Kerberos is not working for them. They do not need it. And then custom permissions. Active Directory is 23, 24-ish years old now. And what this means is there's things that have been layered for years. Uh, Bob set it up. Jane took it over. Now Sally's running it. And it's been 20 years that we've had this Active Directory environment running. Uh, I have seen one from 1999. They were one of the betas of AD. Uh, they're no better than anyone else, by the way. Uh, OUs, group policy objects, and then other sensitive objects like domain controllers. So group policy, group policy misconfiguration is one of the most common things that we see still. The permissions, either they're full control or modify. Uh, user rights assignments are what define what you can do in Active Directory, especially when these group policies apply to domain controllers. And then what we call concerning configurations. These are the, the ones that I couldn't fit in the other bucket, so I put that in there. But there's a number of things that you can do to improve the security of domain controllers. Uh, one of the things that we saw most commonly for years was the principal or service running on DCs. Thankfully, people have gotten the message we don't see this as often anymore. Uh, event auditing issues, still a problem. The event auditing configuration of domain controllers is not where it should be. Uh, user rights assignments, again, giving rights to a group through a group policy on a domain controller. They don't need to be a member of domain admins to have privileged rights in Active Directory. Uh, applications and agents, old versions of VMware tools, my goodness, that is a big problem today. Um, the current version of VMware tools is what, 12 something? Yeah. Okay, uh, we've seen eight and nine. Uh, what does that actually mean in real world terms? Or uh, in kid terms, as my kid would ask me? Uh, that's like six years old. Again, ancient history as far as VMware goes. Insecure remote access, remote access tools. Um, anyone uh, remember VNC Viewer? There's some chuckles in the room. Uh, super secure piece of software, right? No encryption, sometimes uh, often a default password. Yes, we found that on a DC. So yeah, this is a problem. And then still running Windows 2012 or older on DCs. Uh, I'm listing a number of the most important DC auditing settings here. I have talked about these before. We've published these on our website. Uh, these slides will be published, so I'm not going to talk about these, except for this one here. If you want to detect curb roasting, you must select, set this to success. And then special logon, one of the things that people often say why they can't set up auditing or audit people's logons is because there's too many users, there's just too many events that happen. Special logon gives you the ability to actually target specific users. So if you are part of an insider threat group, not an actual insider threat in company, which you might be here, I don't know. Like I'm not asking any questions about that. But if you're part of the insider threat group in your organization, and you're trying to go, okay, well, let's make sure that we're, t we're identifying people that could be insider threat, you can create a group specifically for them and get their logons and not everyone else's through this. Uh, but there's a two-step process to it. So there's a number of user rights assignments that are concerning, that we often see are configured. Uh, add workstations to the domain, since curb relay up, this is now something that really needs to be turned off. There's a couple ways to do it. One is through this. Uh, the other way is setting a uh, Mac uh, configuration, which basically says that users can, uh, by default, add 
join 10 computers to the domain. Setting that MAC to zero means they can't join any. Uh, so, but really this is a more granular way to do that because if you have a provisioning system, you can go ahead and have, have that provisioning system go ahead and add them. Uh, log on locally and uh, log on through RDP. We see this where groups, custom groups, are able to actually RDP into DCs. Debug programs is never needed on a DC ever, so it's not required. Uh, if anyone has used Mimikatz, uh, you probably have typed in debug at some point. That's what that leverage is. So if you remove that right from administrators, Mimikatz does not work using that. And there's a lot of script kitties out there that are just running Mimikatz in script mode and getting debug permissions, and once that doesn't work, they don't know what to do. They are very confused. Uh, apparently, they haven't heard of the, uh, the driver installation, which is a whole other way to get around that. Um, this one's very interesting because this is a way to actually enable and configure uh, Kerberos delegation in the environment, all those things that I showed earlier. Domain admins can usually, are usually the ones that can do that by default. Uh, you can actually change that. Uh, load and unload device drivers. Uh, print administrators have this right, so that can be concerning depending on who's a member of that group. Manage audit and security log, for whatever reason, Exchange always needs this. I removed it one time and broke Exchange for an organization. We're not going to say who. But we all make mistakes. Remember I talked about fail time earlier. This is how we learn. And then the final one is probably one of the coolest, like, most interesting persistence things that I've ever read about in Active Directory. In Microsoft terms, owner means you have the ability to set permissions on something. So if you have owner rights, then you can do things with it. Uh, what if you were able to take owner rights of any AD object? Well, with this, you can. That's pretty crazy. So we have seen this configured, I think, once. This is my not on domain controllers application list. Don't put any of these on a domain controller. And, and certainly not Chrome or Brave, I think, is the other one we've seen. Um, old remote console software, that, that uh, version of PC Anywhere that's like version 10 from, I don't know, 10, 12 years ago, probably shouldn't be on a domain controller. VMware Tools, there we go, 12.3.5 uh, is from 2023, that's a year and a half now. Um, they come out every so often, it's kind of random. We'll see now that Broadcom owns them, how frequently they come out. But versions older than 10.1.0 are vulnerable to a significant uh, security issue. This basically provides the ability for a non-authenticated user to send a command through VMware, through VMware tools to something like a domain controller and run code without actually authenticating. That seems kind of bad. Uh, EDR, just remember that EDR, XDR, whatever you want to call it, has live response capability, which is effectively a shell. Uh, one of my friends uh, termed EDR a, a rat for the good guys or good gals. Um, so that's basically what it is. It's, it's a remote access Trojan, but supposedly on the good side, right? The, it's one of those things where there's, you have, you have certain things that are like, this is good and this is bad. This is good software, this is malicious software, but oftentimes they do a lot of the same things. Uh, SCCM, uh, Brandon on my team will rant and rave about SCCM a lot. He found a CVE uh, related to SCCM. And we end up seeing a lot of interesting, weird configurations of how SCCM is configured, and especially on domain controllers. Um, the Splunk Universal Forwarder, at least when I looked at this years ago, the default install has the ability to run code, um, has the ability to update agents, et cetera. So be wary of that on DCs. And uh, thanks to Jim on our team, we have this wonderful table here that talks about the support status of different versions of Windows. So if you are running 2008 R2 on your domain controllers, uh, it's not supported anymore. If you're running uh, 2012, it's not supported anymore. If you're running 2012 R2, it's not supported anymore. If you're running 2016, you're good for now. Uh, these are your domain controllers. These are the most important servers on the network. They need to run a supported version of Windows. So summary of a number of things that I talked about already. Domain controllers need to be a focus. We find a lot of issues with domain controllers when we're looking at AD. And then there's ADCS, as uh, my Esteemed colleague over here, Jake Hildreth, talks about ADCS is Swiss cheese. Um, there's a number of issues with it, from auditing to certificate templates to the AD permissions to this crazy thing called edit F attribute subject alt name 2, which couldn't be more cryptic, but it's probably one of the biggest issues you could have in ADCS, uh, and then HTTP enrollment. So this is the default uh, auditing for ACA in Active Directory Certificate Services. 
This is what it should be. Anyone see the difference? It's, it, I know it's a little, little small here, but you see there's nothing checked here and then everything is checked here. Microsoft basically said, you know what? You don't need to audit your PKI configuration. It'll be fine, I promise. That's bad. Uh, template options. This is a common problem. As you can see at the bottom, we find about 25% of the environments that have an ADCS in, I, issue, it's usually this. The templates are configured in, inappropriately providing attackers more options than actually the admins and the business operations. And then edit F. This basically says that if this is enabled, when you request a certificate, you can just say who you want the certificate to be for, like a domain admin or a domain controller. Yes, you too can be a domain controller with PKI. And Microsoft even says don't do this, but it's still an option. Uh, ADCS is fun because you just click next, 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 finish, and it's configured. Yes, PKI, one of the most important things you can configure in your network is a next, next, finish thing. And the HTTP endpoints for ADCS is, is something that's very common. This is how a lot of automated systems use uh, PKI. They get their certificate and configure it. There's a number of things that need to be done. Basically, get rid of NTLM, uh, get rid of HTTP, and make sure you have EPA or EPA configured. There's a number of checks that you need to do to make sure ADCS is configured correctly and securely. Um, I chat with folks from Red Siege and a number of other pen tests, red team companies. My question for them is always, what are the two biggest ways that you compromise an AD environment? Anyone want to guess? ADCS, exactly. ADCS. Uh, the second one is Azure AD Connect. Those are the two biggest ways that they are able to compromise Active Directory. Uh, there is a solution to this. There, uh, Jake over here, who I already mentioned, published a tool called Locksmith. It's on the Trimark GitHub. And the great thing about this is it doesn't just find the issue, but it gives you a generated cert util command on how to actually fix that. So you can actually run that to get it fixed. So it's not just about figuring out what the issues are, but really making sure you can get these things fixed. Azure AD, Entra ID. Oh, who doesn't love the cloud? There's a lot of issues with how the cloud is configured these days, from standard user accounts, service accounts. This sounds very familiar. Uh, accounts authenticated from user workstations. We're using PIM, Privileged Identity Management, but all of them are permanent, which means we're not actually using PIM for what it's for. Because if they're permanent members, PIM is the thing that gives you the ability to have users go in and out of privileged groups and roles as needed. So if you're permanently a member of these, that kind of defeats the whole purpose. Now, I'll give a little bit of grace period for a lot of customers because, and companies because once you enable PIM, all of your members automatically become permanently active. So then you have to go through and make them eligible, which takes a little bit of work, but it's a good thing to do, to do that exercise. And then MFA. A lot of companies out there still can't spell MFA, so that's a problem. Applications with highly privileged permissions. This is a big issue that we see. Um, just like service counts in Active Directory that are members of domain admins, in Azure ID and Entra ID, we now have this capability where we can set application permissions at the tenant level. So they can do stuff without people needing to log on with those permissions. But that means, and it gives a pathway for attackers to actually get to that. And I'll talk about that in a little bit. And that directly relates to these two roles, which I'll talk about in a little bit. But standard user accounts being in really any of the Azure AD roles is not a great idea. But there's certain roles that are very privileged that, that I'll cover that need to be protected. And then group nesting. That was one of the things I mentioned earlier. Group nesting. Uh, we've, I think we've done a couple articles about this on the Trimark website. We've talked about this with customers. Why is group nesting a problem? Why? It seems like it makes sense. We create a group called our, our company, Active Directory Admins, and we put that into the administrator's group for the domain. That makes sense. Except someone, instead of using the group name company domain admins, they use server admins. And they're like, domain controllers are servers. Let's just put that in there, too. And then before you know it, everyone who manages servers is a domain admin without knowing they are, which is even worse, I think. I think it's one thing to be like, I'm a domain admin, so I'm going to be super careful and not say I'm a domain admin at an InfoSec conference. Um, 
There's another thing to be like, I'm just a user and I'm going to log in everywhere with my credentials. That's a problem. And then partner access, which is something that wasn't known about at all until uh, SolarWinds and the, cl the cloud-related stuff. So I'll cover that as well. So highly privileged standard user accounts. Global admin is the domain admin, enterprise admin of Enter ID, Azure AD. Uh, so here we have, obviously, user accounts uh, that are directly in this big megacorp environment. User accounts very often are first name dot last name. It's pretty easy to figure out which ones they are. You can usually Google for this. You can look them up on uh, different forums and things like that. Figuring out what the naming standard is is pretty, pretty easy. Uh, those are definitely not admin accounts. And then PIM members are permanent, not eligible. We can just go in and look at the assignments, and we can see that all of these are permanent. Probably they just turned it on. Uh, it's my test tenant, so it's something we did on purpose to show how bad this is. Uh, no MFA. So we can see that there's one account here. This Sean guy seems to know what he's talking about, hopefully. Uh, but all these others don't. Well, they're also user accounts. So that's part of the problem in this environment. There are 100 roles in IntraID. Let me say that again. There are 100 roles in IntraID. I cannot name them all. And I've been dealing with Azure AD for almost 10 years now. I don't know what all of them are. They're, they're listed here. Um, that's a problem. And that's part of the reason why we have so many challenges. Active Directory has the same number of groups that it did two years ago, that it did four years ago. I'm not going to go back 10 years, because there was one or two that were at it. But basically, it's the same number of, of groups. And certainly, it didn't go from like 20 to, I don't know, 100. And these groups, the, the, these roles, the permissions that they have change behind the scenes as well. So that makes it challenging. So Microsoft said, you know what, customers, we're going to help you. We're going to put a tag of privileged on the ones that we think are the privileged ones, so that way you know which ones to focus on. OK, that's fine. Uh, administrator, administrator, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But they have global administrator here right next to global reader, which I have a problem with because you cannot, in any stretch of the imagination, equate the rights and privileges that Global Admin has with Global Reader. That is not how that works. Global Admin has the ability to read and change everything in Azure AD and Microsoft 365. And by the way, jump over to Azure and all your subscriptions. Global Reader can look at a bunch of stuff. That's a bit of a difference. Like To me, that's the difference between watching the game on the TV and actually being the MVP in the game. Like There's a little bit of a difference there. Slight difference in bragging rights, too. So what we did at Trimark is we've actually categorized these into what we call levels. Um, we didn't want to use tiers. Microsoft already did that. So we came up with what we call level zero roles. These are the ones that are the most highly privileged, as I put up here, effective full admin rights or capability to gain full admin to enter ID. So global admin is full admin rights. And there's this article based on research I did years ago, how you can jump from Azure ED to Active Directory via Azure. Really fun. Uh, how that works, because basically your global admin can flip a bit, also called the magic switch, and jump over and have full rights to uh, Azure. The hybrid entity administrator basically can change federation settings, which gives them the ability to control authentication into the environment. Uh, I talked to Microsoft in 2021 about this role because it popped up in like the 2020 timeframe, and it had it was basically global admin light, and over the Next year or so after that, they tweaked and removed some rights and then put some rights back on. Really, the federation setting is still the concerning one. But it's the hybrid identity administrator, so I guess that's what it's supposed to have. Uh, partner tier two support hit my radar because of this article from the wonderful folks over at SpectreOps. Uh, it can reset passwords and invalidate refresh tokens. So refresh tokens is when you sign on. That's proof that you're signed on. So if you invalidate that, you have to sign on again. Um, but because it can do both of those things, including global admins, if I can reset a password for a global admin, what am I? A global admin, exactly. So like, it's no different. Uh, this was meant for a very specific partner scenario and was never meant to be used more broadly. It doesn't show up in the default GUI, at least in certain places. Others, other places it does. So this is an amazing persistence opportunity for an attacker until Microsoft either neuters this role or removes it. Uh, privilege authentication admin can basically change passwords for anyone, including global admins. And privilege role administrators are the ones that can change the role membership, including global admins. So this seems pretty straightforward. This is where it gets fun. So we have level one. 
This is page one of two because there's a lot of them. These are the roles that are highly privileged, that have privilege escalation potential, depending on the configuration in the environment, and, or the ability to reconfigure the security posture. So what does this mean? Application administrator and cloud application administrator. Two roles you really want to remember if you have any involvement in Azure AD and ID. Remember earlier I mentioned that a lot of applications have very, very highly privileged rights or permissions to the, to the tenant for that application? Application administrator and cloud application administrator have the ability to add a credential to an application, password, certificate, whatever, any application, including those that were created and the global admin then accepted and granted some of the most highly privileged rights and permissions in the environment. So because of that, if you have an application that is very highly privileged that I already mentioned, I'll show you what some of those are, and you have, I don't know, a user in application administrator or a user in cloud application administrator, guess what? That's a two-step process to then jump to basically having global admin rights. Uh, directory sync accounts have the ability to update application credentials. Same thing. I'm not going to cover all of these because there's a number of interesting things around it. But Microsoft does label a bunch of these as privileged, 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 um, privileged, privileged. The only one that's not privileged here is this one here. This is the role that gets, uh, this is the, the group, the role group that gets added to every device when you do an enter join, an Azure AD join. This is one of the default ones along with your global, global administrator. So the member of this role has admin rights on every system that has been joined to enter ID. Every one of them, including your, your admin workstations, assuming that you use them, which I'm not going to ask anyone to raise hands because it would be embarrassingly small. Um, and I don't want anyone to be like, oh, you do that, great. Exchange administrator, that seems weird, Sean, that doesn't seem to fit. Guess what attackers go after? Data. Attackers want data. That is the one thing that they always are going after. I have worked a breach where a, an account that was a member of the exchange administrator group was compromised. Uh, password spray, no MFA on it. And the attacker, pretty smart, they went through and set an ACK on every exchange online mailbox, so authenticated users had the ability to read all the mailbox contents. So guess what? That happened in about 10 minutes. After that, they did not need exchange admin rights anymore. But that is something that attackers absolutely go after. So we have a level two role list, and it's all the data service uh, administrator roles. So it's like Yammer, what's Yammer? Um, SharePoint Online, uh, OneDrive for Business, Teams, et cetera. Exchange is the one that we bumped up to level one because attackers will go after this. Um, and then there's a number of other privilege roles. Basically, help desk, administrator, password administrator, user administrator, these are the ones that can change passwords. This gets very interesting when you have a user that is an owner of an application, a user that is an owner of a role assignable group, I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. Uh, if you can change the password of those, you can then escalate your privileges pretty easily in, in, in Azure AD, Enter ID. Uh, partner tier one support is one step down from partner two, or tier two because we know numbers and math, and this basically doesn't give the full rights, but it does an enable the ability to reset passwords and validate refresh tokens for only non-administrators, but can do a bunch of stuff with OAuth 2 permission grants, which can be interesting. More importantly, update application credentials. And Microsoft has a chart, but Andy did it better, so this chart is way, way better, which talks about who can change what passwords, which is incredibly confusing. Um, I'm not going to talk through this because that, this article here does a much better job. Again, the slides will be available later. Admin group nesting, we have these things called role assignable groups that can be then placed into a role, which makes sense. The great thing about a role assignable group is Microsoft at least learned something from Active Directory where if we put a group inside of a role and a role is very highly privileged, we don't want just anyone who would normally have rights to modify the, permit or the membership of that group to be able to do that because then they would be a global admin. So role assignable groups are these special groups where it's a group in Enter ID that has the flag, is role assignable as yeah, true. And that means only global admins or privileged roles administrator can create them and modify them. Except, except, there is one caveat to that. So we have this one, Big Megacorp Global Admins in Global Administrator. This is a pretty common thing that we see now. And here we have a bunch of user accounts in it. 
So what they did was they looked in the global admin group and they said, there's no users in there, all our admins are there, we're good, check, we've passed our audit except when we look at this group, which by the way, in the user interface, for some reason, when we click into this, it doesn't show our members. It does not. We have to then copy this and go to our group part of Entra ID. I know this is exactly how it works because I did it two days ago. Copy and paste it into the groups list, go into the groups list, and then enumerate it. See where this is a problem? So we have to go over here to this groups list and see what the members are. And we see that they're all user accounts. Group owners. What did I say earlier about owners? They have permissions and privileges and rights. The owners on a role assignable group can modify membership. These are user accounts. It's not what we want because this completely bypasses the security controls that we have. And either one of these can add themselves or anyone else to this group, this role assignable group, which is thus thereby de facto nested inside global administrators, which is bad. So shifting from level zero roles to level zero applications. There are four level zero application permissions that we cover. Um, I put a little asterisk after this because this is what Microsoft says, directory rewrite all grants access that is broadly equivalent to a global tenant admin. There's a little bit of debate about this as to whether or not it actually has these rights and, and what an attacker can do with it. We're gonna keep it here because a lot of things that were theoretical have become practical and I'd rather have focus on things that are concerning or Microsoft says it's concerning because at some point they did have permissions and privileges behind this that had a lot of rights. So that's the first one. The second one, this is amazing. The permissions here allows an application to grant additional privileges to itself. So I'm just gonna write on my ticket that I'm a global admin. Uh, any other application or any user. That sounds way overpowered. Uh, and then role management, read, write directory. This is the management of directory role membership as well as role assignable groups. And then the last one, application read, write all. This provides full control of applications just like application administrator. And we can review these with PowerShell. There's a PowerShell script here at the bottom uh, that you can run in order to do the, uh, run this query or this, this scan against your environment, directory read, read, write all, application read, write all. And then there's a couple that I'm just pointing out here. Remember I said that attackers love uh, getting access to mail. It's probably one of the most common things they do once they compromise an environment. Uh, so I flag those as well. And who are the application owners? Application owners, guess what, can add an application credential or a credential to an application, a password or a certificate, and thus impersonate that application. So if this uh, RD test app has one of those level zero application permissions, guess what? Any one of these owners can then become a global admin. Like I said, it's not great in this situation with Entra ID, uh, but don't worry, I have some hope for you. Tenant hopping is what I'm calling the situation where you have uh, an account in tenant A, and there's some sort of trust configuration with tenant B. Microsoft set up this thing called Partner Delegated Administration. And this was leveraged uh, during the SolarGate attacks, so the solar wind cloud attacks, where a ma major cybersecurity provider was compromised. Uh, their, their Azure AD, their, their entire Microsoft 365 environment was compromised. They had no idea why or how. It was because they had a cloud, security, cloud service provider that had delegated per permission administrations to their tenant. Why? Because that's how Microsoft designed it. And the way that they designed it for some reason was one group here has global admin rights to every customer that that cloud service provider has been granted and that customer is accepted. So that means one account in this partner environment gets compromised, hundreds of customer tenants could be compromised. So Microsoft has changed this to delegated administration which uh, they do this wacky thing with, um, it's, it's actually granular delegated administration. So they went from delegated to granular, because it's better, right? Um, we've seen this once, I think. So it's, it's new, it's better because of the more granular configuration for the partners. Uh, Microsoft had to take a while to figure this out because on the back end there's, uh, there's actually financial incentives for CSPs, the cloud service providers, have these rights to manage things. Often just, Buying a license from a reseller gets this configuration set. So you definitely want to check 
this page, uh, which is updated now. At least it's on the main page in Entra ID. It used to be buried, uh, but it's on the main page now. <sighs> Let's talk about Storm 0558. So we found out last year that a Microsoft signing key for Microsoft Cloud Services was compromised at some point. And I, I love this tabletop here. A core dump containing secret keys has been exfiltrated from an engineering laptop. And it's like too soon. Uh, this was bad um, because ultimately what happened was uh, Microsoft had a crash that happened on a Windows server. I know it's shocking, right? Uh, and this, it was moved over to a system in the crash dump analysis. It was scanned for sensitive information. There was no sensitive information, so it was there. Um, Storms got access to this crash dump, and this crash dump contained the signing information for this key, which ended up being an MSA key, which actually signs tokens for the consumer side of uh, Microsoft Cloud, which is really, really bad. The other part of that is they didn't actually separate the signing keys and have a uh, a domain check, basically. Is it, is it consumer or is it enterprise? And Exchange Online added in and enabled this key to be able to sign it, but they didn't do those checks either, assuming that Microsoft Global did do that check. So it was like this cascade of failure. So uh, Storm 0558, which uh, is, is said to be uh, Chinese threat actors, had uh, gotten this consumer signing key and just started creating their own tokens and signing them. And then used those to OWA and basically went through and compromised in a, a, a uh, 20 ish organizations and about over, there's several hundred uh, accounts that were compromised. I'm not going to go through the whole thing of, of what the att attacker is. But basically, a uh, high degree of technical tradecraft and operational security. Um, a lot of campaigns uh, are involved here. But how is this possible? This is where it's crazy, okay? One, like I said, crash dump signing, uh, the consumer signing system, April 2021, three years ago. Uh, a race condition allowed the, present, uh, the key to be present. The key's material presence was not detected, which it should have been. It should have been filtered out. It went to the debugging environment, which is internet connected, which is part of the process. Their credential scanning didn't find it. Log retention wasn't long enough, so they don't have logs around it, so they're guessing, kind of. Um, and then the common key meta, uh, metadata publishing endpoint, which didn't do scope validation, that domain validation I mentioned. And then Exchange uh, just set it up so that it would accept the consumer signing key. And then, then finally, there's validation error. So like a comedy of errors, among all the comedy of errors, right? And CISA has a scathing review about this, uh, which was published uh, just last month. And they said that uh, this storm group has struck the espionage equivalent of gold and accessed the official email accounts of many of the most senior US government officials managing our country's relationship with the People's Republic of China. They find the intrusions were preventable and should not have occurred. They also concluded that Microsoft's security culture was inadequate and requires an overhaul, particularly in light of the company's centrality in the technology, technology ecosystem and the level of trust consumers, customers place in the company to protect their domain and operations. They list out the problem here, and at the bottom they said there was a series of operational and strategic decisions that collectively point to a culture issue. Unfortunately, this is cloud in a nutshell, folks. All right, we are trusting another company to do the right thing. Unfortunately, they often don't. Uh, State Department was the first victim. They found this and told Microsoft this was a problem because they had this premium service that provided them the mail items access log, which enabled them to see it. You had to pay for this in order to even know that this was happening. That is the problem with cloud today. It's not just Microsoft. Google Workspace logging is horrible, far worse. Uh, 22 enterprise organizations, at least 503 related personal accounts worldwide. This is as bad as it gets. Until midnight blizzard. So Midnight Blizzard, uh, Microsoft said, hey, we found this thing. There's a threat actor that's been in our systems. This was January. They were talking about October, November, just recently. And CISA goes, uh, this is a problem. This is another problem that Microsoft has. Uh, what we know, uh, Midnight Blizzard, so it's APT29, Cozy Bear, Russians, uh, basically password sprayed an account in a legacy non-production system, Azure AD, this account wasn't believed to be privileged, didn't have MFA. They popped that account. 
Then they realized it had privileges on the Microsoft corporate tenant. They leveraged those permissions in order to, on this application, in order to jump and create another application, which gave them access to the email system, exchange online in the Microsoft production system. So if Microsoft can't get this right, what is the chance that everyone else can get it right? I tell you right now, I do a lot of assessments of these environments. It's, it's rarely done right. We've worked with some of the largest companies around. They're all trying to figure this out. Cloud is one of the biggest heartaches, heartbreaks, problems in our industry today. Uh, this all happened in late November. Microsoft didn't spot the intrusion until January 12th. Why? Maybe they didn't pay enough for the logs. <laughs> My favorite part of this is I found this article on, from Microsoft on how to uh, do password spray investigation from uh, November, which predated this, this, uh, this issue. So if they read their own articles, they might have been able to avoid it. Not, not just poking fun, uh, and I'm running out of time here. Okta, there's a bunch of issues uh, with Okta and its integration components. There's a couple different things. There's delegated access. Okta AD agents, this is very similar to what Azure AD Connect can do. And I'm, uh, this is all from, uh, uh, by the way, uh, Okta mentions MGM as one of the customers. Uh, Okta for Red Teams, great, Red Teamers, great article by Adam Chester. He published this uh, September. It's fantastic because he talks about how to compromise a user account in AD, leverage that to auth to Okta, to SSO to anything else without MFA or compromise the Okta service count in AD, and then auth as anyone you want and SSO to other systems. Uh, he also figured out that you could capture the AD credentials, very similar to PTA on Azure AD Connect, or create your own Okta uh, agent, and then just use that to sign your home keys if you have the rights to do it. Um, and then Okta has had a whole bunch of breaches themselves. Again, cloud is complicated, even for the cloud providers. And the attackers know this. Cybercrime is a business. It, it, it actually works, and they're profitable, and they do a better job than a lot of other businesses out there. Uh, speaking as a business owner, this is impressive to me. Um, and there's a number of issues here where basically they can cast a very wide net and then go down to a smaller number, uh, and they just need one to get ransomware on it. A timeline of the MGM resort attack, uh, this, is, this is as bad as it gets. So Caesars was hacked, MGM was hacked, uh, apparently it was the same group, but basically there was a, a timeline that was put together here. Uh, Scattered Spider uh, was the one that uh, is believed to be behind it. Uh, MGM put out a, a, a statement in September 11th, September 12th, they said uh, it's all resorts including dining, entertainment, gaming are still operational, and the attackers said, well, guess what? Not anymore, and they basically started shutting things down. Uh, VX Underground made a post about it as a result of phishing. I hate that word. Can we just say phishing via something else? Because it's stupid. Are we gonna use like every letter of the alphabet? Vishing, bishing, nishing, zishing, kishing, and then we'll start adding other letters to it, unpronounceable letters. Um, so uh, Scattered Spider was the one uh, that did it. Then Moody said, oh, well, this might negatively impact their credit. Well, no kidding, Sherlock. Good Lord, come on now. Um, and then it highlights key risks in MGM's reliance on technology. Well, I, uh, everyone's relying on technology. So then they put out an article on their website saying, hey, we're having some problems. Sorry for the inconvenience. Your call is very important to us. I love this. All the Alfie ransomware group did to compromise MGM resorts was hop on LinkedIn, find an employee, then call the help desk. <laughs> this is a problem. And there's a lot of uh, systems that were down, including their gaming systems. It cost them a lot of money. Uh, the attacker said that they sniffed the Okta agent, was able to get those passwords. They had super admin rights to Okta, which meant they could do anything with Okta. Uh, they had global admin privileges to the Azure tenant. Um, and then they launched ransomware attacks against more than 100 ESXi hypervisors. Everything is at risk in, the, in these environments. You need to look at this identity nexus that I'm talking about. Cascading failure. One thing was a call or a check of, of LinkedIn and then using the MFA to a help desk member. Caesars was like, you know what, we'll just pay the fine. 
That might have removed the ransomware, but did it remove the attacker? The password says no. So what is the current state of Microsoft Identity Security? OK, raise your hand if you think it's good. I'm glad there's no hands raised. I won't ask you to raise your hand and say it's bad. Um, Trimark does Microsoft Cloud Security Assessment, so that's Azure AD, Entry ID. 35, roughly 35% of all the environments that we've assessed in the past year rated severe critical risk. That means one step, compromise, immediately they're done, it's over. 8%, um, just below that, 30% for kind of fall in this like medium level. That's not good. How about Active Directory? You think that number goes up or goes down? Who says up? Raise your hand. Okay, who says down? Or uh, who says it goes down? Raise your hand. Okay, well, if you watch the Trimark folks, you know the answer. It went up. <laughs> Three quarters of all Active Directory force globally, across industries, across sizes, across companies, from the Fortune 50 and beyond, have critical risk in their environment. We've looked at just about every industry, just about every size company. It's a problem. So fix these common issues. Here's the links. Again, this will be published. Uh, slide will be published. Um, there are issues everywhere. Everyone's having problems with this. We're trying to share some information so that some of these things can get tightened up, can get fixed. Um, but it takes a village, unfortunately. So that's been my time. Thank you very much for yours. My new headshots. Um, it's lunchtime, so feel free to go to lunch. But if you have questions, I'll be at the Trimark booth right after this. Uh, thanks again. Really glad everyone's here. Uh, thank you very much for being here.